Welcome back, fantasy fiction fanatics. It's great to see you again, and I hope you're doing well. Today, we're going to do another character analysis, and today's character is going to be Edmund Pevensey from the Narnia series. So, I'm going to say that today's analysis is going to be a little bit different than other character analysis because Edmund is um, a very interesting character in the fact that the first story that he's in, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, he is one particular kind of character. But then toward the end of that story, he does a big switch. Uh, he has a big character change in him that, where he learns a lot of things and he realizes what he's been doing needs to be changed. And that change affects how he is throughout the rest of the stories that he's in. So we can't really just do an analysis based on one story about him or um, the other stories that don't include the first story about him. So we're going to do kind of a side-by-side -side comparison. We're going to have how he is originally and who he is when he start at the story, and then we're going to see how he is in the rest of the stories and how uh, he becomes who he was meant to become for the rest of the stories. So we're going to kind of analyze both things and take both things into account when looking at this character. Um, I'm sure a lot of you do know about Narnia and either have read the books or have watched the movies, um, but for those of you who haven't seen or haven't read them at all and don't really know much, I'm going to go ahead and do just a little brief uh, explanation about the stories. Um, there are six books and there are, I believe, three movies, and most of the stories relate back to the Pevensey family. Not all of them, mostly uh, the books, all the movies are, um, but there's a couple of books that don't revolve around them. But for the main portion of the Narnia series, they relate to different different times that the Pevensey family has gone into the Narnia world, which is a mystical fantasy world that can be, connect, uh, can be accessed through our world uh, by various ways and uh, Narnia kind of seems to call to them and asks for them to come when it's, it's needed. So yeah, the, basically that's the main portion of the story without going into detail about each different story and what each story revolves around. That's the basic premise. Um, there are four Pevensies, Peter, Edmund, Susan, and Lucy. And so today we're going to be focusing just on Edmund. So Edmund, at the start, just to do like a basic profile of him, as, uh, and obviously he changes since the years go past in the books and things like that, but just to start out with who he is, is basically um, he's a 10-year-old when we start in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. He has two older siblings and two younger siblings. Um two sisters and one brother. And then uh, at the very start, World War II is going on uh, in the real world and his father is in the war. And that's basically the basic info that you have about him before we start our journey with Edmund and the rest of the Pevensies. So not too much that we get before we really get jumping into the action and stuff like that, but I just thought we would kind of go over it based on our starting point and see where we've gotten from our starting point, and then we'll see what happens when he transitions and goes through those kind of, uh, his trials and things. So first, let's go ahead and start with the traits and his different traits that he has. Um, again, we're doing a side-by-side -side comparison, so I'm going to start with his traits in The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe. So these are the ones that I came up with. You are welcome, as always, on these character analysis to list other ones down below that you have seen or that you disagree with, agree with, whatever else, you're welcome to comment down below about. So, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, his traits that I have are that he's defensive, he's low on self-confidence, very rebellious, feels misunderstood or forgotten, selfish, hot-headed, and naive. So this is how we start off the story, where he has these traits and that's what affects him uh, to being the person that he is throughout the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Um, I would say with these traits especially that he is not 
a very liked character through most of the first story that he's in. Not saying that we hate him like we would hate a villain or anything like that, or the witch queen, uh, who is the villain in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, but we don't really like Edmund either. He's the snotty brother who uh, is betraying his family. So we don't really love him at this point, and we think that he is totally misguided and doesn't know what he's doing, and that's a lot of the naive stuff, and we are angry that he is so naive and that he would even think about doing these things. Um, but then in the later novels slash movies, um, he becomes much more confident. He becomes very mature. He is much more family oriented. He's calm and smart. So you can see that his traits from the first story to the later stories is completely different. He is no longer naive. He is no longer hot headed. He is no longer selfish. He becomes basically a 180. He completely sees the error of his ways and he flips over to being like, no, this is not the right way to be. I've learned my lesson. I'm going to care about my family. I'm going to think things through. I'm going to be calm. Uh, at times even, um, he's calmer than Peter. When in the first story, I know this isn't uh, a Peter analysis, but in the first story, Peter is very calm, wise, the oldest brother, trying to look out for his siblings. Um, he's the one that's thinking things through. And in the second story, we see that he is much more out of control and that it's Edmund reeling him back in and being like, hey, I've been down this path. I understand what it's like to be irrational. Let's just take a step back. Um, so you really see that transition, that difference that he has. You really see that he's a lot more confident and mature and that he's gotten it together based on what happens to him in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. You can also see that he becomes very much a loved character. He's very much part of the family once again and you actually are proud that he has become such an amazing person and that he has overcome his issues that he had and is now working to help protect his family. And there are many times that you see him step up to the plate and you completely accept him as being part of the good guys once again. It's very easy, despite not loving him in the first story, you find it very easy to forgive him just as the characters forgave him. Um, because I think you, in a way, you kind of relate to him. You can see his struggles that he goes through with his family, the time that his dad's in the war, he's going through all these problems in his personal life and so you could kind of see how hey this is how he came to this and he understands that he's wrong and he's going to make things right and at times he even pulls back people from making the same mistakes that he did and so um, as an audience member as a reader you really come to enjoy having him back and enjoy seeing this change in him and start loving him again all right so let's go ahead and go to his role in the story and discuss that a little bit. So he's got a couple different roles depending on the story. But The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, his main role in the story is to be the betrayer. Um, he is the one that sells his siblings out to the enemy for his own personal gain. Now he doesn't, along with his naivete, he doesn't really realize that he's selling his family out. But at the same time, he does know that he shouldn't be doing what he's doing. So it's a hard, hard line to see what you think we should decide, whether he really knows what he's doing or if he doesn't. Part of me says that he really didn't totally understand what he was doing. Part of me thinks that he does kind of know what he's doing and he's just trying to save himself. It's kind of hard to totally understand his motivations other than that he was taken in by the Witch Queen, given a lot, given a lot of promises that obviously she wasn't going to keep, and he believed that he was doing what was best, at least for himself. And I think a little bit for his family because she does mention that she's not going to plan on hurting his family. She just wants all of them together. And it's not until he actually 
interacts with the witch queen and he's failed that he understands her true nature so that's why i say i don't think he totally understands what he's doing but when he does hear the story from the beavers about how terrible she treats everybody he goes anyway even though he knows that his family would not want him to and that it's against everything that this family said that they were going to try and help and save um so he's not really a terrible character his role isn't necessarily to um to hurt anybody his role is really to just to cause tension to cause strife to cause an extra layer um and to add to the dynamic now we've got even more problems we're in narnia um tumnus has been captured they're running for their lives from the witch queen and now their brother has betrayed them and taken the witch queen's side and now they don't want to hurt their brother and they want to save him but they also have to save themselves and since he's on the opposite side how are they going to do both so his role is really just to betray them and to add the extra difficulty that is presented in the story the extra motivation to try and get him back the feelings the hurt feelings of like what are we going to do now that our brother has sold us out and how are we going to get away from the witch queen what is the witch queen doing to him because they still care about him um and it also makes it so they can't just fight the witch queen head on they the queen now has something of value of to them their uh, their brother is something that they want back so they have she has a hostage basically and they have to work around that as well um so yeah uh, not too much more to say on that portion of his betrayer status. Anything else you think I should have mentioned? Go ahead and list it down below. And we're going to go ahead and move on to his role in the later stories. So basically his role as betrayer completely switches for the rest of the stories to become a strong ally. He's never really... I don't want to say any of the... Pevensies are really ever the main character. They're all the main characters, even when some of the Pevensies don't come back to Narnia. Um, it's never like Edmund is ever the main role. Um, so he's always, to me, in my opinion, he's the ally. He's always the person that's there to help whoever he's with in Narnia. He supports them. He defends them. He helps guide them. He helps roll them back from his mistakes he is has dedicated himself to making up for his past mistakes and becoming a strong ally that everyone can rely on he does the duel um by himself and decides he's going to do it he helps against the witch queens um not really revival but she tempts peter next in this the second story and he brings him back from that um, he constantly is defending the Narnians, and he's a really strong ally to them as well. He really has become a protector and an ally and someone who is loyal and fierce, and his role is mainly to help the others in his situation and to help them progress through the story. So that way everybody can progress together. All of his family can make it from one point to the next point. Yeah, there's not too much to say on his role in the next couple of, of stories that he's in. Um, I feel like that covered everything. I hope that that did for you. Let me know if you feel like I left something out or if you feel like I didn't delve in deep enough for his role in the later stories. But I really feel like that is the main essence of him is just to try and help and redeem himself and to make sure that he never falls down that path again, nor lets his friends and family fall down the path of darkness yet again um, and to help support them in the journeys that they're making so let me know if you think otherwise or if you agree or anything else that I missed or anything else that I need to add go ahead and leave it down below okay what does he bring to the story it's a really important question 
you might think, oh, well, we've already done his role, so that's what he brought to the story. Um, but what he d brings to the story is different than your role. The role is how um, a character acts and behaves in the story. But what they bring is actually like what happens as a result of this character. What kinds of things in the story happen because they are this role. Maybe it'll get a little bit clearer once um, I talk a little bit more about it. So the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. What does Edmund Pevensey bring to the story of Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? He brings tension and uncertainty. Not only just because he's tense and uncertain, but also because of his, the way he acts and what he does brings tension and uncertainty to what's going to happen to him, what's going to happen to his family, what's going to happen to Narnia, what's going to happen to the Narnians. Um, it brings tension and uncertainty all the way around because you don't know what's happening with him and if he's going to help the Witch Queen. Ice Queen, Witch Queen. White Witch. Witch Queen is not even a thing in this. The White Witch. Right? Oh my gosh. Am I nuts? Let me know down below. Like, it all sounds really similar, but I'm pretty sure I'm supposed to be saying the White Witch. Anyway, <laughs> if she's going to win, or if um, the Pevensies are going to end up being able to defeat her, um, that is the tension and uncertainty throughout the whole thing all revolves around Edmund. I'm not saying all of it. Some of it is actually just because the White Witch is really evil and deadly and will kill anybody that she wants to. But uh, a lot of it is racked up because of Edmund and because you're not really sure what Edmund's going to do. He's kind of a wild card placed in there. Um, and you're not really sure what's going to happen to him or what's going to happen because he's betrayed his family. Next is that he brings humanity to the story. Humans are imperfect and humans at times can be selfish and humans at times can make bad decisions and humans, especially when they're 10 years old, did I uh, bring that back up again to, to remind us all he's 10 years old at this time are not always the smartest people. <laughs> um, sure, you're thinking Lucy's younger than him and she's fine, but being the middle child, I'm sure some of you guys know, I don't personally know, but I know other middle children who have problems because they feel like they're lost and forgotten. And I feel like that's really how Edmund feels. That's why I put that up in his traits, because I feel like he thinks everyone in his family is out to get him. He's not the perfect uh, oldest son. He's not Susan, who's older and wiser and always tells him that he's, you know, to grow up. He needs to grow up. He's not Lucy, the uh, angel youngest child that can do no wrong. He's lost in the middle. And I think that's a lot of it has to do with why he does what he does. is because he's just human and he feels lonely and lost and like his world is crumbling around him and so he makes bad decisions and he makes the choice to betray his family and it's not because he wants to hurt his family it's just because he wants to feel special and the white witch said that she was going to make him special going to make him a king going to make him ruler of Narnia and make him somebody worth being and he really craved that so he really just brings humanity to this story, brings relatability. Even though we don't like his choices, we understand his choices. We understand, based on his character, of how angry he is and how, um, and how alone he feels at the time. This is why he makes these choices. And he also brings forgiveness to this story. Because... He lost his way, he went down the dark path, he joined up with the enemy, but in the end he understands that he did wrong and he earns back the forgiveness. At first you might think he just has kind of given it because 
hey, his family loves him and they just instantly forgive him. And there is a little bit of that. But he also, afterward, after he has been given that forgiveness, he decides to spend the rest of that story, as well as the rest of the stories afterward, earning that forgiveness. And dedicating himself to being worthy of that forgiveness. And he shows that people can be forgiven and mistakes can be forgotten. And that it doesn't make him a terrible person because he accidentally did some terrible things that he didn't really realize the consequences of. Now for what he brings to the other stories that he's in, uh, the first thing that he brings, in my opinion, is loyalty. Um, he really learns what loyalty is and is unwavering in his support of his family and his friends and the other Narnians that depend upon him. Um, he really, he's really the main person that stands up to be loyalty in these later sh uh, shows and stories and novels. Um, he's the one that is constantly on everybody's side. He is right there, doesn't matter, he's gonna try and do whatever he can to protect the people that he cares about. So I feel like we've got this really big 180 again, I keep mentioning that, but uh, it really is true is that, you know, before he was the um, the main shower of not being loyal, <laughs> and now he is the steadfast, loyal person, and he would do anything in his power to care about you, and he would never stray from you and doing what is right. Never stray from his family, never stray from the Narnians. He would never take the enemy's side ever. And you come to really believe that about him, that he would never, ever, ever decide to stray and to go back to the enemy's side. He is 100% loyal and 100% cares about the people in Narnia and cares about his family and cares about the people that originally he had no care whatsoever about. Well, I can't totally say that. He did care about his family even though he was angry. Um, but he really didn't care about the Narnians when he first got there. Uh, he could have cared less. So it really shows the change in him and he is steadfast loyal and he would jump in front of a sword for them. He is also, when he, the next thing he brings is reminders. He is constantly reminding his family that he messed up and he's already been there and we do not want to go down that path. Especially with there being um, a new prince in the area with um, uh, the, the prince of Caspin, um, Prince Caspin, um, and he really reminds his family, we are no longer the people that we were when we first were here because, you know, they grew up and then they went back to being kids when they went back to the real world and now they're kids again. And they've also left this world for a long time, left it to have no king or queen uh, to rule them. But he reminds them that they are different now. He reminds them that they can still protect these people. And even though things are different, they can still be successful. He reminds them not to go down the path that the White Witch set him on. Um, they set him, uh, they, he reminds them about his own follies and their follies and reminds them not to give in to despair. He's constantly, constantly, constantly reminding them about their past mistakes and their past, um, their past, um, triumphs as well. It's not just mistakes. It's just saying, hey, let's not give up hope. This is where we've been. This is what we've been through. We got through it. This is where we are now. We're better off than we were before, or we're in the same states, or whatever else it is. He is like, we can do it. He reminds them to continue being strong, to continue to go forward, to continue believing in Narnia and what is to come. So yeah, he is a reminder, and he 
almost is the the hope in these stories i guess you could say another thing that he brings is the hope because he doesn't let them stray too far like he did and last thing he brings is bravery when we start out he's very much a coward <laughs> um, i'm sure even he would tell you yes i was a coward he goes to the witch queen because he's too scared to be on the opposite side he is too scared to stand by his family and he is too scared to t say that he was wrong and to come back willingly he is now the epitome of bravery he goes into battle for the narnians he fights the duels for the narnians he is the first one to stand up and say we don't give a crap you enemies we don't or we won't ever fall against you he is the one up there at the front taking charge understanding what it means to fight what it means to be on the side of good to sacrifice what needs to be sacrificed and to do what needs to be done and he is brave enough to step into those dangerous positions and to battle it out so yeah you can really see the two different stories and how completely opposite he is and you can see when you do watch or read the lion the witch in the wardrobe the changing point that he has how the sacrifice that was made for him really changed him and made him realize exactly what he's been doing and who he wants to be and how much he's let everybody down but he's willing to make up for it and he does in the next story um, a comment I'd like to make about him as a betray betrayer in general is that he, to me, he kind of stands out, um, stands out compared to other betrayers that, you know, you might have read about in other stories because he is never really evil. And I guess you could say that that is the case of a lot of betrayers is that they're not necessarily evil, but he doesn't betray his family to want to hurt them to um to bring them to harm he actually betrays his family because he wants to be kind of a hero he wants to be the one that brings them victory um so and he just thinks that taking up the the white witch's side now i can't think of whether it should be witch queen or white white witch like it's like mixed up in my brain i'm so sorry <laughs> like yeah we're just gonna move on please someone in the comments below you're welcome to tell me how wrong i am on either account because one of them is wrong dang it let me know down below <laughs> how much of an idiot i am thanks i'll appreciate it um but anyway he merely wants to be the hero it's not that he wants I mean, he does want to gain in the fact that he doesn't want to be killed and that he does want to have glory. So he is typical in that way. But he really just wants to be acknowledged by his family. And so he betrays because he wants to be acknowledged. Because he wants to feel good about himself. He doesn't want to bring anybody harm. He doesn't want to get anybody hurt. He just feels like that that's the way that someone's going to finally love and care about him. Because he doesn't realize that he already has the love and care that he's always wanted it just it's strange because everybody in his family is having a hard time at the moment uh, all of their dads are the ones that are in the war and all of them have had to move from and leave their mom to live in this mansion to get away from the bombing so yes he wants to gain something and he does do it for a selfish purpose but it's not betrayal and the fact of just getting some money. It's not betrayal and the fact to just, you know, he decides that he wants to be on the winning side. It's really not that simple. Like a lot of betrayers can motivations are really that simple. They're just greedy and they are just selfish and they just want to be on the winning side or they just really want the money for the payout because they don't really have any loyalty at all. It's not that he 
wanted that. He just wanted to feel special and wanted to show his family he could do something right. Of course, it chooses him, makes him do something that's not right. But that's really all he really wants is just acknowledgement from his family and to show that he is just as important as the rest of his family because he doesn't feel that way. So in a way, he's doing it for his family, thinking that he is going to be doing something good for his family, and it ends up not being the case. So I really feel like that is why we forgive Edmund in the end, is because we realize that he actually didn't want to betray his family. He didn't think of the consequences. He didn't think about what he was doing. And that led him to do something that he shouldn't have. But he didn't do it really for just stupid personal gain. Just, he's 10 years old and he just wanted to be acknowledged by his family. He just went about it the wrong way, unfortunately. Um, and he is also brought back through other characters seeing his worth. His sac uh, he is being sacrificed for and he is being forgiven. So he has really been brought back from his betrayal to being this loyal person because they recognize those things in him. They recognize he didn't betray just to betray him and they didn't betray he didn't betray them for just no reason. Um, because he just made a mistake and he was taken in by an adult who said, hey, let me give you everything you ever wanted and let's join with your family and make sure that everyone gets in. It's all going to be a great, happy place. Only for it to not be true. So he's brought back from being a betrayer. He's been forgiven and he's been um, salvaged from the wreckage, I guess you could say. Uh, and that's also something that's very unique. Because a lot of betrayers do not get saved, do not get pulled back into the fold of the good, cannot redeem themselves. And most of them do not want to redeem themselves. They're just like, hey, I got my payday, peace. See you later. Like, don't give a crap about you, really. <laughs> but Edmund does care. And Edmund did want to be with his family and did realize his mistakes and was able to be saved through realizing his worth and how his family never thought he was worthless. They just wanted him to not be so hard to deal with, <laughs> to not be so angry and to fight so much. Uh, they forgive him instantly. They're just like, hey, come be with us again. We're so happy that you're back and that you're safe and that we are now in this together. Mistakes were mistakes and let's just move on. Let's just move past. And sacrificed him some literally some, uh, literally there was a death that was given for him by Aslan um, in order for him to be saved and something like that really st probably sticks with a person I'm sure just like um, as you can say religious types of, of um, similarities um, it really changed him to know that, that a complete stranger, somebody who had n no reason to do it, sacrificed themselves for him so he could be with his family and to be saved. And that's what really brought him back and showed him that he could be the person that he always really wanted to be. All right, so just one last thing. I'd just like to talk about his goals um, that he has in the story, what motivates him? We've already kind of touched on it as well. I've gone through those other items, but just to be really clear and state what I feel like his main goals are in the stories. I didn't really set them aside as this story versus this story um, because, you know, with having so many stories that he's in, he has different goals for different ones. Um, but these are the main goals I feel like happen in the first one and overall throughout the rest of them I guess you could say so goals uh, the first main one I thought of was to escape the white witch's punishment by being her ally to become special by being her ally to there's so many reasons why he joins up with the white witch that we've mentioned earlier but really he really just wants 
to be special and to be acknowledged. And so he, and to escape, you know, the fate of all the other Narnians, um, by becoming her ally. So he starts off with his main goal is to be her ally and to do what she wishes. That's why he also gets his family once they're halfway through. He goes and sees her and says, hey, I mean, I didn't bring them all the way here, but I mean, I got them in here in Narnia and, um, I got you close. <laughs> Um, he really wants to be her ally. So that's the first main goal. Um, and the second one kind of goes along with the first one. I already kind of touched on it a little bit, but he wants to feel special and important, given to him by the promise of being royalty. So he wants to be the ally, so that way he can escape the punishment and to be special. And along with that, the specialty comes with because she said she will make him royalty. And then he will be acknowledged as being somebody special. And to be acknowledged as somebody important. As somebody who isn't just a kid. Because he'll be able to make decisions then. If he's royalty, he's in charge. So, those are his two main goals. Especially in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Um, and then the third goal is to make up for his previous mistakes and to protect his family. So I guess you could kind of say that's a little bit of two goals, but I feel like it kind of ties, kind of ties together. And the fact that in order to protect his family, he is also constantly trying to make up for his mistakes. And yeah, I feel like those are the main goals that he has in the stories. First, it starts out with the stuff with the white witch and then it continues to being after he's done with her his main goal is just to make up for his mistakes and to protect his family while they're in narnia and to help his family in narnia all right i guess that is it for today that's all the notes i had on edmund pevensey and my analysis of him let me know down below what you thought of this analysis if you thought that i messed up missed anything out if you feel like you disagree agree what you're thinking on the matter if you just want to talk about him and you want to uh, have me explain or to have me uh, delve deeper into certain things let me know down below i would always love to have a conversation with you as always love to hear your feedback and yeah so if you have any comments questions concerns anything at all please let me know down below um, I also have a Twitter. If you want to go ahead and talk to me on Twitter about Edmund or about anything else, I do post a lot of things about fantasy fiction on there as well, um, at fantasy fiction one. And yeah, so let me know anything you'd like to discuss, any things that you'd like to see in the next character analysis, any characters you'd like me to analyze or anything else. Let me know either down below or on my Twitter feed. All right. I'll see you guys in the next lesson. Bye.